Cambridge colleagues are part of a long tradition of people imagining the future. The researchers that you will hear from are the next step in that long and rich history. They're seeking not only to understand the world today, but also to imagine the world we may live in tomorrow. Cambridge is nurturing the ideas and producing the innovations that will be passed down to future generations. Tackling topics that range from infectious diseases and life after climate change to menstrual shaming and watching seals from space, our researchers are truly at the leading edge of discovery and invention. I invite you to join me to learn how Cambridge Research is helping to make the world better for all of us. Hey, I've got a game for you. Can you tell me what this sound is? And now have a go at guessing this sound. One of those sounds was a seal, and the other sound was a sound from space. Find out at the end which is which. I'm Prem Gill, I'm a PhD student in Antarctic Studies, and I'm looking at how we can use satellite images to study seals from space. To study seals from space, we use satellite imagery, which has such a high resolution that you can see seals, baby seals, and even blood on the sea ice from a seal giving birth all the way from space. The reason we use satellites to study seals in Antarctica is because seals live on the sea ice and the sea ice in Antarctica can cover an area that's double the size of Europe. This means if you were to go out in a ship or a boat to try and count all the seals, it would just be too costly to do. And satellites provide us a cost-effective way to monitor the whole of the Antarctic region. But one big challenge we have when it comes to studying seals with satellites is actually knowing whether the big black blob you're looking at is a seal or if it's a rock. To get around this, I went down to Antarctica with a field spectrometer where I was basically holding a really long pole over seals and measuring the sunlight that was reflected off them. So the whole idea behind this was to see whether or not we could look at wavelengths invisible to the human eye, such as UV and infrared that's reflected off the seals to not only tell what is seal and what is rock, but also potentially be able to tell different seal species when we look at our satellite images. The great thing about using satellite imagery to study Antarctic seals is that you no longer have to be someone who's privileged enough to be able to get down to Antarctica to actually study the species that live there. By using satellite images, you could be in your bedroom, on your laptop, in exploring regions that no one's ever been to, looking at colonies of penguins and seals that have not been discovered. And the great thing about this is not only does it allow scientists like me to be able to explore these regions without having to visit them, they also provides an opportunity for loads of other people to get involved with polar science. One of the best things I've been able to do during my PhD is bring together students who had never engaged in polar science before to work with me in looking at how we can use state-of-the-art satellite imagery to monitor polar wildlife, including seals and penguins. It was amazing to see the students looking at these abstract black blobs on this white background and slowly realizing that they were witnessing the first moments of a seal's life upon the sea ice of Antarctica. Through my polar science PhD, I've been able to engage with lots of outreach. I've worked as a researcher on Frozen Planet 2. I've guest lectured at Oxford University. I've set up hackathons and collaborations with the Iron Tring Institute. And I've even appeared as a cartoon within a children's book all about how we can help save the world. Another thing I've been able to do is set up Polar Impact, which is all about changing the face of polar research and providing opportunities to those from underrepresented backgrounds to become future polar scientists and polar explorers. The reason I try to make polar science more accessible is not because it's seen as a nice thing to do, it's because it's essential. We need people from all walks of life engaged in polar science and leading it. The polar regions are far too important to be left to a small community. We really need to have as many people involved as we can. So, did you guess seal or space? The first sound you listen to is actually space. So we have a space weather observatory in Antarctica with a low frequency radio receiver. And that's able to pick up or radio waves created by our planet and turn them into audible sounds. And the first sound you listen to is actually the southern lights. So when the southern lights or the auroras are generated, 
um, natural radio waves are emitted and those are picked up by the low frequency radio receiver and turn into audible sounds which we've dubbed the dawn chorus because it sounds a little bit like birds singing. And the second sound is actually a big old chubby Weddell seal making sounds in Antarctica and sounding like a little fat spaceship. In the past, it has been common practice for veterinary health experts, public health professionals, and environmental health specialists to work separately. But now we're moving into a new framework called One Health that encourages everyone to work together. For example, if you look at anthrax disease, when an outbreak occurs and animals die, people can get anthrax when they get exposed to the animals or their products. And also, when these animals are not buried properly, they contaminate the environment. So this is a classical example of the definition of One Health. And now we're seeing that 60% of infectious diseases are zoonotic in nature, meaning they can jump from animals to humans. And this will most likely increase in the coming years. My name is Valentina Ndolo. I specialize in applying machine learning to understand the distribution of anthrax risk across Uganda and Kenya. I chose these two locations because the two countries have had several sporadic outbreaks of anthrax disease and these outbreaks are becoming more frequent and the intensity is also increasing. The outbreaks affect livestock as well as humans and this is a really big concern for public health as well as veterinary health. So one of the challenges facing ecological datasets is sampling bias and what this means is that areas that are closer to surveillance sites are usually more sampled than areas that are further away and this causes a big problem for niche modelings and this is why I've decided to use a new approach that can incorporate these uh, structural dependencies and design more accurate models that can actually be more useful to policymakers and stakeholders. For my PhD, I specialize in laboratory sciences, being a biochemist and also doing a lab-based project for my master's degree. So when I started my PhD, I was a complete tech newbie. So that means uh, I hadn't really applied some of the methods I'm using now before, and I had to learn them from scratch. When I started uh, my PhD during my first year, I attended various online courses as well as the free training courses offered by the university and I was able to learn how to use different computer programming methods, particularly R, and also how to apply machine learning methods like uh, Maxent and Inla, as well as other algorithms that are used to uh, predict disease hotspots across uh, wider geographical areas. So one of the biggest challenges in terms of pursuing scientific careers at advanced levels is really understanding the kind of area you want to pursue and how to go about making the applications. And sometimes this is difficult, especially when uh, prospective applicants don't have an idea of how to write uh, personal statements or how to write the research proposal, how to approach the supervisors and secure one, generally just how to go through the application process for admission and scholarships. And this is the reason why I set up Stemming Africa Initiative, to provide talented young women with the skills they need to understand how to write their proposals, to write their personal statements, to approach supervisors, and generally how to do their applications so that they guarantee the success from the onset. Because when I was applying for my PhD and when I was applying for my master's, I did it basically alone. And I really understood how important it was to have some sort of background information, some mentorship from someone who has been through the process. So yeah, this is what I'm trying to do with the initiative, just to be that gap, be that um, middle person to help these uh, talented young women to get places at leading universities across the world. Three quarters of all infectious diseases are caused by animal farming. It is also a leading cause of climate change 
as it is responsible for more greenhouse gas emissions than all of transportation combined. It is also Earth's single biggest land use, taking up around 30% of Earth's land surface. This also makes it the leading cause of deforestation. Furthermore, it is one of the top causes of water pollution as well as antibiotic resistance. Cultured or cultivated meat is real meat made by growing animal cells in a container outside the body called a bioreactor. It could be a safe and sustainable alternative to animal farming that doesn't require harming or slaughtering the animals. So I've co-founded Animal Alternative Technologies. It is a spin-out from the University of Cambridge that is creating the Renaissance Farm, a scalable end-to-end -end cultured meat manufacturing system that empowers food producers to make their own meats. And this can be done pretty much anywhere in the world with the right tissue engineering tools. We can also uh, customize the meats and, and tailor them to the client's required specifications as well as local diets and tastes. My name is Yash Mishra and I'm a final year PhD student at the Department of Chemical Engineering and Biotechnology. My PhD entails developing bioelectronic human brain on a chip models or in vitro models to study neurological diseases like Alzheimer's and replace animal testing. Over 90% of drugs that uh, pass animal testing fail clinical trials, likely due to species differences. This has resulted in the cost of getting one drug to the market to rise over $1 billion and it takes over 10 years because to get each drug uh, successfully to the market, you have to pay for nine failed drugs. And so it is important to develop in vitro models that represent humans very closely in order to develop treatments more effectively. Effective altruism is a social and philosophical movement that advocates for using evidence and reason in order to benefit others as much as possible and acting upon that basis. It is basically using our resources in the most efficient ways to make the maximum possible impact. Our co-founder Clarice and I both believe in effective altruism and use it while making most of our decisions. We actually met at an event for effective altruism and Clarice helped me realize that the techniques and technologies that I've been using to grow cells from the human brain in the lab could also be used to actually grow meat in a safe and sustainable way. And this eventually led to the founding of our company. The first cultivated meat burger was unveiled in 2013 and cost $300,000. And in the nine years since, dozens of companies have spent hundreds of millions of dollars on developing cultivated meat. However, we still don't have cultivated meat on our plates yet. This is because there is still no commercially feasible large-scale production process. To achieve this, a plethora of interdisciplinary skills and enabling technologies are needed. And we cannot do this on our own. Various raw materials like stem cells are needed, along with the skills of biochemists, electrical engineers, designers, programmers, and many, many more people. We even need lawyers too, uh, because there are a lot of unknowns as uh, most countries haven't come up with regulations for cultivated meat yet. We still don't know how it will be labeled, for example, like whether it'll be vegetarian or vegan, is it going to be considered halal or kosher? Maybe uh, since we are bringing cultivated meat into uh, markets and bringing meat production into the digital age, it might require a completely new label altogether. We are in this very exciting uh, time um, where there's a big sort of wave that's going to come uh, with this industry and revolutionize the way food is produced forever. Menstrual shaming has negatively impacted women for centuries. It has negatively impacted their relationships, their health, and their general potential. But now with so many women using menstrual tracking apps on a daily basis, I think we can use that opportunity to shape technology which can help to overcome this stigma. My name is Ronja Grieb. I study for a PhD in philosophy and I specialize on menstrual shaming. I was already interested in the female body and philosophy of the female body, but I read about the women's soccer football team in the US and they won the World Cup in 2019 and what I thought was really interesting is that they attributed part of their success to tracking their menstruation, their menstrual cycle. So they adapted their training and recovery needs to the phases of the cycle they were in. 
But what they also said is that they found tracking their cycles with apps a very empowering experience. So they felt liberated to talk about the menstruation, they felt, felt more in tune with their body. I think one of the reasons why they highlighted menstrual tracking specifically is I think because it allowed them to get more in tune with their body and that's something that from athlete to everyday person a lot of women and girls don't usually do. They are very stigmatized about a lot of parts and processes in their body so they view their body as alien or weird or they never really get in touch with it. That's how I think it's interesting to connect the professional athlete to the everyday person and the girl in school because both of these across generations have this dissociation from their body and I think it's interesting how menstrual tracking apps can overcome this. So I think it's important to think about this from a philosophical perspective because for one reason there's an injustice in menstrual shaming that I think is important to articulate but it's actually hard to pin down. So a lot of people conduct their bodily needs in private, right? And we don't think that's unjust. So someone may say something like, you know, I go to the toilet multiple times a day and uh, I don't feel like I need to talk about this, but I don't, also don't feel that I'm wronged in any way. And I think that's valid. It shows that the real problem is not with privacy as such. Empowered women may still conduct their menstruation in private. The problem is where the demand for privacy comes from and how far it goes. And I think once we start thinking about it in this way, we see that really there's this norm body that is male, able-bodied, young, for which many spaces are designed for. And if you deviate from this norm body, as many people do, right, then you can't conduct your daily life in the same effortless way. And I think that's unjust, and I think it contributes to the subordination of women in society. One of the ways I go about thinking about this is to look at where we actually have data or stories from people who experience menstrual shame today, especially in the UK. So what kind of spaces in life and areas of life do we have data and experience on? And one of the big rounds is sports um, and specifically school sports. So it's one of the few parts of puberty and of youth where we have girls telling the story of how menstrual shame impacts their participation in school. There's a lot of research thankfully already done by great NGOs such as Plan UK who go into schools um, and who interview the girls on their menstrual experience. So a lot of my research draws on this, um, but I also think it's nice to have the actual exchange with girls who are currently in school. And I believe the great thing about doing something like menstrual shaming is that everyone sort of has a story to tell. So whoever I talk to about the research I do, right, they will tell me how their life experience is like. Um, fathers tell me how their experience with their girls and daughters talking about this topic is like. So it's a mix of studies and research that has been done by NGOs, but also getting in touch every day with other people about this topic. So although Cambridge is of course a very academic place, I think it's also a great place to do this particular kind of research. One reason is that there are just activists here who already do a lot of great work around menstruation, around period poverty and around educating women, girls and men about this topic. The other reason is that there's a lot of opportunities here locally and across the country to reach out to the girls who currently experience menstrual shaming in their school experiences and I found that very important for my own work to do that, to get in touch with, with the girls and understand their experiences. And then a third reason I think why Cambridge is a good place to do that is because you have people here who develop this kind of technology. So one example is Alma, which is a company that has been co-founded by um, people who work here in Cambridge, and they are very keen to get anthropologists, sociologists and philosophers on board to make the best technology possible. So you are really sitting at the core of where the development is going on of new technologies and you can influence that from its inception. I think in one way, Femtech of course has tapped into 
the market potential there is for attending to half of the population. So, and I think that's perfectly valid, right? Because capitalization and marketization can lead to positive changes, can lead to funding be being allocated to, say, reproductive health. I also think that it's slightly focused at the moment on this specific niche of professional sports, because this is just where more money, I think, can be made. There are differences between this kind of technology for professional sports, where it really is focused on recovery and training needs for very specific forms of doing sports, to the everyday women who, women who can still gain something from this. And I think expanding it in this range will be a challenge and will need some adaption of the femtech space to ask itself if it wants to go more into a direction of empowering every woman rather than having empowerment be sort of a side story to the training and recovery needs. For my parents' generation, apocalypse was contained within a briefcase with nuclear launch codes. And for my generation, apocalypse is within a hamburger or a plane ticket. It's democratized and it's something that belongs to each of us. And how we think about that apocalypse, how we look at it, how we bring it into our bodies and our families and our work, that matters because when we imagine the end of the world and act on that imagination, we are, consciously or not, building the future world that we're going to inherit. My name is Stephen Lezak. I'm a geographer at the Scott Polar Research Institute, and I study the politics of the climate frontier in the Arctic. We still talk about Arctic explorers and Arctic expeditions when much of the landscapes up there have been inhabited for millennia. The way that it's changed is that instead of now going to view this landscape that's supposed to be so different, utterly different from our own homelands, we go there and we see projections of our own future. This comes across in popular media in particular, the way that we talk about Arctic futures as implicitly our own futures. And so Arctic explorers today they're not just explorers over land, but we also think of them as explorers through time. One headline that always stands out to me appeared in a newspaper a couple years ago, and it said, the Arctic is in a death spiral. And it struck me at that point, what does it mean for an entire region of the planet to be dying? And who are we as humans to pronounce what is life and what is death for that whole place? We have to understand that Climate apocalypse is not something that happens to the whole world. It's already happening to certain communities in certain places. And yet, for these communities that are on the climate frontier, these frontline communities, it doesn't look like their world is ending. It actually looks like their world is changing into a radically different place. Where apocalypse invites inaction or surrender, Climate change actually experienced on the front lines is a call to action. It's a call to build new homes. It's a call to do things as mundane as build infrastructure. But there's no waiting for something on the horizon. For these communities, they have to act now and they need support now. And we only do them a disservice if we keep projecting out into the future, waiting for the next shoe to drop. This is a very consistent extension of the colonialism that has taken place for hundreds of years in the Arctic. What began with whaling and continued to gold mining and later to oil and gas extraction always saw the Arctic as a resource. It was always an unpeopled landscape and the people there were an inconvenience to be either ignored or moved. This happened for centuries and the intergenerational trauma faced by indigenous Arctic people today is extremely real and has huge consequences on livelihoods and communities. There's one community called Nutak, which is 
a village of about 300 people that's built on collapsing permafrost. The village is already having to relocate to a new site several miles away, but they were only able to secure funding to move about half of the village. And so as we speak, this is a community that has essentially cut itself in half. The people at the new village site are waiting, requesting funding from the government to be able to build the remaining homes that are required so that their friends and their relatives in this small Yupik community are able to join them. And the question that I tend to ask people because I ask myself this same question is could I imagine this same displacement happening in, say, Louisiana? And the answer I always come to is no. There's something about the Arctic and the distance and our thoughts about it that we allow to justify the suffering that other people experience in these landscapes. It gives us permission to turn away from these livelihoods and not take responsibility for their needs in the present. We have to make sure that climate change is catalytic and not conservative. And when we are hung up on ideas about global apocalypse, then we put ourselves in a mindset where we're trying to save something. And what we end up trying to save ends up usually being the world circa 2007, which was not a great world for many billions of people. That's why it's so important to, alongside the grief and the loss and the mourning, to think about the world that we're trying to build at the same time. This is not just a world without climate change, but it's a world after climate change.